Well, I'm not going to try to pursue what Mark is uh, speaking on, which is revival. But what I am going to minister tonight is a very important part of revival. It's a very important part of God's kingdom. And I want us to begin by reading a passage from the book of Hebrews. Now, in the book of Hebrews, the writer is writing to Christians who desired to go back under the law. And uh, so th this whole issue in Hebrews is, is about that, the law versus the gospel. And in the Hebrews, there are, I think there are five places where the writer pauses and warns us Christians about certain things which can happen in the handling of the gospel. So we're going to read this first warning in Hebrews 2. I'm going to read the first four verses. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So great salvation. So the writer of Hebrews is trying to alert us that we can be very immature in our understanding of salvation and all that salvation means and all that salvation brings with it. And the wording of this indicates to us that we can uh, drift away. The Bible uses the word neglect, but it, that's not a very good translation. It, it literally means to just drift away, that, that we don't hold fast to the, the entirety and the greatness of what Jesus Christ did for us at, at Calvary. So we're warned that we can neglect so great salvation. And in that, that text, the writer of Hebrews said that the Lord in his ministry spoke this salvation. And those who heard him wrote it down for us so that in this year 2023, we can actually have information about what went on back in 30 A.D. through 33 A.D. in the ministry and life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are here in 2023, and our issue is, how do we know that is true? How do we know that what we read in the Gospels is actually what was said, actually what was done? There are none of us here that know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're, they're not dear friends. Uh, we, we just have what is in our Bible. And the Bible tells us men were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write it down, and here it is. But we, we cannot read these verses without emphasizing what the verse said. The verse went through this, this whole teaching about how powerful salvation is, and it said that God bears witness to it, that God testifies about it in this day and in this age. We understand if you go to a court of law what it means to bear witness. It means that, that you're putting an amen, you're putting a yes to everything that has been said. And so we have the Lord speaking the gospel, and we have those who heard him writing it down, 
And the writer of Hebrews says it's so great salvation. And then it ends by saying God bears witness. God puts a yes and an amen. Now let us not take this lightly because God's in another realm. He, if you want to know, if you know an extraterrestrial being, if you know God, you know an extraterrestrial being. You've encountered someone from another dimension. And God is in another dimension. And all that was written down, all that was said, God testifies. And the Bible says God testifies with signs, wonders, miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit. This supernatural element to the gospel. Something that uh, is not... Uh, uh, able to be produced by us. It is a divine testimony, signs, wonders, diverse miracles, gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the writer of Hebrews says God bears witness to it. God's putting, yes, amen, this is true, this is right. And sign, wonders, miracles, gifts of the Holy Spirit are, are God's testimony. God's saying yes to everything that is preached, everything that is written, God testifies. Now, these words are not real clear in our understanding sometimes. The word signs means uh, a, a kind of a divine authority. Like at the end of the age, the Bible says, there will be signs in the heaven and in the earth. And we know that as far as weather is concerned, none, no human can control weather. Uh, weather is under divine authority. So there will be signs that, that will be evident. They're not uh, created by men, human beings. They are, are evidences of divine authority. Wonders uh, simply mean acts that are supernatural, uh, when you encounter them, you know that, that something's going on that is not natural. It's completely supernatural. And diverse miracles mean things that no human could ever produce. A miracle is the act of God producing what God can produce. And then there are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And those are the abilities of God. Now, the giftings of the Holy Spirit are set within the church in, in people, Christian people, such as we are here. The clear teaching of the Bible is that every one of us Christians should understand we should have at least one gifting or ability of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul lists nine that are active in Christian life and in the local assembly, the church. They, they are uh, the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, uh, the gift of, of wisdom, revelation, discernings of spirit, the gift of knowledge, the gift of faith, the gift of healing, the gift of miracles, tongues, kinds of tongues, prophecy. Those are abilities that are totally supernatural which are working in us. So this great salvation is far beyond a religious system because we understand from human history that... Uh, there, there are just religious systems that have nothing at all to do with Almighty God, have nothing at all to do with, with the a story that God began in Genesis and is going to end in the Revelation. Uh, you know, they, they're just religious systems, and, and there are many of them here. And the Bible says we have to be clear in our thinking we, we should not neglect this, that there is this super, 
natural testimony of God given to the gospel. This is how God clears the field and makes known what is true through signs, wonders, miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit. And uh, Hebrews said to us, we should be careful. We, we don't drift away from that truth. It is so great salvation. And we should be careful that, that we are not casual about that, that we are not careless about that, that we truly understand the greatness of what God has done for us, and we understand that when we uh, handle the gospel, God will testify. God himself from another realm will put his amen on it with the supernatural signs, wonders, miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit. And it is a tragedy for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to lose sight of that. This is what uh, the writer of Hebrews is saying before he even begins th this great uh, writing in Hebrews. He warns us about this because in our everyday life, in our encounters with life, we meet tribulation and we meet trouble. We, we all have had days like that. And if we are not careful, we will elevate trouble beyond the greatness of salvation. And I want us to know tonight, healing and health is greater than any disease, any disease. Healing and health has been bought and paid for. There is no sin that cannot be forgiven, no sin. And we have to understand how great our salvation is. And we cannot elevate things above the supernatural workings of God in the church. And if there is anything we need in our lives, it's God's testimony. How many like God's testimony? Signs, wonders, miracles, diverse gifts of the Holy Spirit. If God wants to show up and testify here tonight, we'll let him have the platform. Would that be okay with you? you we like God's testimony. Now, the Apostle Paul understood this. The Apostle Paul, before his salvation, was one of the elite religious leaders in Judaism, the Jewish law. He was a Pharisee, and they were the elite of the elite. He was a studied man. He was learned. Uh, we have only to read what he wrote in his letters to know how brilliant he was. And he uh, was persecuting Christians. He absolutely hated Christianity, was born again on the Damascus Road, and spent the rest of his life preaching the gospel and wrote two-thirds of our New Testament. Now, the Apostle Paul, in, in his beginnings, was sent by God to the Jewish people because he himself was a Jew. But that did not go well. The Jewish people persecuted him terribly, and he turned to Gentiles. Gentiles are those who aren't Jews. We're Gentiles here tonight. If you're not a Jew, you are a Gentile. Now, in the Jewish thinking... The, the Gentiles were not good people. There was this big racial divide between Jew and Gentile. In fact, uh, Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 2 that God did away with that division and made us one in Christ Jesus. But he was sent to Gentiles. And he began to go into Gentile cities and minister to Gentiles. For example... The Corinthian church is a Gentile church. The Philippian church is a Gentile church. And in Romans chapter 15, Paul wrote concerning his coming to Rome to preach the gospel to the Roman people. He ultimately was going to leave Rome and go to Spain 
He was beheaded before he could get to Spain. And this is what he wrote, Romans 15, verses 18 through 19. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. And how did he make Gentiles obedient? Now understand, Gentiles had no, no background. They've got no history. The Jews had background. The Jews had history with God. Gentiles did not. Uh, they, they were outside of the scope of Abraham's covenant. And Paul said they became obedient. And God worked to make them obedient. Now listen to it, Romans 15, 19, through mighty signs and wonders, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel. From Jerusalem in the land of Israel, Illyricum, a Roman province that's right across the ocean from Italy, in that whole area, Paul said, I have preached to Gentiles. And he said, I have fully preached the, the gospel. And I think when he says he fully preached the gospel, he included signs, wonders, miracles of the Holy Spirit. And he gives us a real truth about why God testifies with signs, wonders, and miracles. It produces obedience because these Gentile people uh, ha had no story with God. They, they did not have the story of Moses. They, they had no testimony of a burning bush. They, they, they were just outside the whole scope of God's purposes. In the whole Old Testament, uh, most of it concerns Jewish people. And every now and then, there's the insertion of Gentile people. And God set aside the Jew to bring in the Gentile. We ought to thank God tonight he did. Thank God uh, he allowed us Gentiles in. And, and Paul said that these, these Gentiles who had no testimony of God, he went into their cities and he preached Christ and they became obedient. And they did not become obedient people because he was an outstanding speaker. Uh, there's no indication he had such knowledge that he touched their heart and they said, oh, he's so wise. It was the signs and the wonders, the testimony of God that stopped them in their tracks and caused them to listen to Paul and to become Christians. And, and it was this testimony of God that produced obedience. And I have found this to be true. I've been a Christian for 69 years. 54 of those 69 is a spirit-filled woman. And I have found that when people uh, fail to encounter the supernatural work of God, that many times uh, they, they aren't obedient because they haven't experienced uh, this, this this uh, testimony from another world. Uh, Gene, my husband, was born again, and the day after he was born again, he had a very bad cold, an allergy. At that time, Gene was a CPA, and he was going to the bank with a client so the client could borrow money. Gene was his accountant. And Gene was in the driveway of our home. He had been born again one day. And he remembered uh, the teenagers whose testimony he had heard saying God would answer prayer. And Gene in our driveway asked God to give him relief from this cold because he couldn't talk and he was blowing his nose and he didn't want to go to the bank that way. And he said, God, would you give me relief from this cold? And by the time Gene backed out of our short driveway, God had totally healed Gene uh, of a bad cold. The second day of being born again. 
And that was 1963. And from that day to this, Jean has fully served God. And I think there was a key that it began supernaturally with a testimony of God, that God delivered him and touched him. And, and God will do this. So understand, and I want us to understand this because we have to handle this very uh, carefully with holy understanding. Signs, wonders, miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit are not God's entertainment program for us. It is not God's entertainment program. These are testimonies of God, and we should never treat it as some sort of show, side show. Uh, God does not honor that because these are testimonies of God. Now let's, let's pursue Paul again. We're going to read from 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 through 5. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, And I, brethren, when I came unto you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you, here he uses the words, the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of the power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, the Apostle Paul uh, was brilliant. You have only to read his letters and understand our New Testament letters, they call them the Pauline epistles, were letters. He's not writing from a theology school. He writes letters. And, and they are outstandingly brilliant. Uh, that someone could write letters like that from prison and in the places he wrote is amazing to me. He was a smart, smart man. I think it's in Ephesians chapter 1. Paul goes on for 14 verses without a period or a comma. Now, that's, that's pretty brilliant when you can talk 14 <laughs> verses. And we, we just kind of huff along trying to read it, and he's just dictating a letter. But he tells us very clearly here he was not a good public speaker. He was smart. He, he was brilliant. Uh, but he, he was not a public speaker, meaning he didn't grab you uh, when he spoke from the pulpit. He said very plainly, when I came to you, it was not my excellent speech. Uh, it, it was not that. I was with you in weakness, fear, much trembling, I don't think he was an outstanding pulpit preacher. Uh, he, he testifies to that. We know that's true in the book of Acts. I can't remember where it is. He preached real long one night, and a man in the third balcony fell out and died in the service. So that's pretty boring when, uh, <laughs> in Jesus' name, don't die in my service, okay? Don't die in my service. <laughs> But the good thing about Paul, when the man fell out of the balcony and died, Paul had the power to raise him from the dead. Hallelujah. And, and Paul said, it, it wasn't my brilliant speaking. Gene and I one time were invited to do a conference, and there were three of us. Gene was a speaker, I was a speaker, and there was a third man who was one of these brilliant men. He could read the Bible in Hebrew and Greek. And, I mean, he was smart, and I like smart people. But he was one of these people you had to sit tight and listen to him. Have you ever had people like that? And you think, now, what did he say? That was good. What was it? You know, you had to really, really listen. And uh, it was just, you know, that kind of thing. And it was good. It was good. And I, I just grunted and strained trying to understand it. And Gene had to follow him. And so I was just glad I didn't have to follow him. That's how smart he was. <laughs> and Gene's just Gene. If you don't know that about my husband, 
Gene is just Gene. He doesn't try to compete with anybody. So he stood up and did his Gene sermon. And a lady came up afterwards and she said, Brother Evans, I just wanted to tell you that out of all the sermons I heard tonight, yours was the greatest. And Jean said, well, thank you. She said, I couldn't understand another word that other man said, but I enjoyed you. So, <laughs> so you might not have enjoyed hearing Paul preach, is what I'm saying. But now Paul went to Corinth, and Corinth was one of the filth pits of that world. In that culture, in that time, they used the word uh, Corinthians as, as an evil thing. They, they would say to live like a Corinthian. It was very evil. Paul even says in one of his writings that some of you were drunkards, you were uh, homosexuals, you were thieves. They, they were bad, bad people. But Paul went into that area of Corinth. Uh, it was Greece. Corinth is in Greece. And started one of the biggest churches that he would found during his ministry. And we know a lot about it because we have two of his letters that he wrote there. He was the founder uh, of that church. And he says very plainly in the scripture that we read that it was not his excellent preaching he said, I was with you, and I was weak, I was fearful, I was in trembling. But he said this, I was able to demonstrate the Holy Spirit. I, I'm going to go back and uh, read it uh, to, to you again. He said, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but it was in demonstration, listen to this, of the Holy Spirit and of his power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So, so here is God saying to us that there should be demonstration of the Holy Spirit. Signs, wonders, miracles, gifts of the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit wants uh, to be evident. And the Holy Spirit lives in God's people. So we have to understand if the Holy Spirit is going to demonstrate, then, then he requires us to cooperate. The demonstration of the Holy Spirit. When I was first spirit-filled, I had come from a very religious, traditional Methodist church. And I was in that church from my mother's arms until I was 30 years old. And to my knowledge, uh, we never experienced anything supernatural. It was a good church. We had good pastors. I was born again there. But I never experienced anything that to me, I looked at it and said, this has to be uh, the Holy Spirit. And this is what the writer of Hebrews is warning us about. We can settle into a comfort zone, and we don't press ourselves into the fullness of what God wants to do, the supernatural gospel. Now, the um, amazing people to me are, are the people in the book of Acts because these people in the book of Acts ha had nothing to go by. You know, today, uh, we've got things to go by. If you want to go out and start a church, you can just Google, and there's just all kind of information on there. You can visit churches and say, well, we'll do it that way, we'll do it this way. The, these 120 in the upper room didn't even know what a church looked like because there had never been a church. These 120 in the upper room entered into something supernatural that was far beyond their understanding. They were speaking in tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. Those 120 had no idea what they were doing and why they were doing it. But it was God inserting himself 
into the lives of human beings to fulfill his purposes. On the streets of Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost were 18 cultures walking the streets of Jerusalem. Acts chapter 2 tells us who they were. These people from different countries were walking the streets of Jerusalem. And the 120 came out of the prayer room into the streets, which is where God wants signs, wonders, miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit to operate. And all they did was speak in tongues. And the cultures stopped. And Acts 2 tells us there was this uh, question that was asked, what is this? And that question is very pivotal to Christianity because 3,000 are going to be born again out of this experience when Peter preaches, but it begins with three questions, three words which are a question, what is this? And I think the tragedy of modern-day Christianity is that question is not asked of us by the world. What is this? That we move very freely in our world and in our culture, and, and, and there is no what is this, this supernatural element that testifies, this supernatural element that, that is God's fingerprint on his church. And Peter answered and said, well, this is that which was prophesied by Joel, and 3,000 people were born again. So we know at least 3,000 or more heard Peter preach that day, and the church began. Now you read the book of Acts, and that group never descended into just religious theology where their lives were, they met together and they prayed over their problems and they went home and hoped their problems got better and came back and just kind of this seesaw between problems and victory, although God meets problems. That, that's not the story of the book of Acts. I, I'm just going to read some of the verses. We won't turn to them. Acts 2.43, many signs and wonders were done by the apostles. Acts 4.30, by stretching forth thine hand to heal. That was when Peter prayed for a lame man sitting at the gate of the temple of Jerusalem and his hand was stretched forth and Peter uh, healed that man that day and it touched the whole city of Jerusalem. Acts chapter 4 later says, there is a notable miracle done and it has spread throughout Jerusalem. One notable miracle spread the gospel. It was out in the streets, in the temple where people were. Acts 5 verse 12, by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders done among the people out in the world system. Mark would call it your 50 feet. Uh, Stephen, the first uh, deacon in the Bible who was martyred for his faith, it says Stephen was full of faith and power and he did wonders and miracles among the people. Acts 8, the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip, Philip is the evangelist, which he spoke, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. And uh, Philip had gone into Samaria, which is uh, an area north of Jerusalem, not, not particularly all Jewish. And the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 8 that he preached Christ, he cast devils, out, demons out of people, he healed the sick, and the whole city had great joy. One man with signs, wonders, and miracles in his testimony brought a city to the Lord Jesus Christ. It says uh, of Paul himself that God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul so that they would actually lay handkerchiefs on the body of Paul 
and, and the power of God would go into the handkerchiefs and they would take the handkerchiefs and lay them on sick people and people would be healed. The Bible calls that a special miracle, meaning it doesn't happen every day. This was uniquely given to the Apostle Paul. And, and I read all of these because the, these people began with, with salvation. They were baptized with the Holy Spirit. And there was no organized church, like a, a building where they could go and meet. Uh, there, there wasn't any training. And I read that, and I wonder what, what happened to them that, that they could move this way out in the world that they were supposed to reach. Uh, these, these were just Christians changing the world. And they were doing it because of signs, wonders, miracles, diverse gifts of the Holy Spirit, testifying to the message that they preach. Their message was just not an intellectual message. You need to be born again. There was the supernatural element that, that came with it. And in my years of dealing with people, I have found that things that touch people very, very deeply are usually very supernatural, uh, like Jean being healed. It was very supernatural. And when Christians don't understand this, and when Christians live without understanding, God has made this available to all of us to minister to those that are in the world, we, we can neglect so great salvation. Now, there are people, you know, and, and I've had people talk to me this way, that, that believe uh, such has passed away. There is that, those in the body of Christ who would say to us that that was for the early church, and when the early church ended, it stopped, and there are no more signs, wonders, miracles, diverse gifts of the Holy Spirit. And my answer to that is, if that is true, why would not God tell us emphatically when it's going to end? Who was the last person? You know, wouldn't God say, now when John, John the Revelator dies, it's over and done with. Wouldn't God let me, as a Christian, just go down uh, some la-la trail that no longer exists? No, we have to understand that as the end of the age escalates, if evil escalates, dear people, if evil escalates, God's power will escalate with it. And evil will be answered by power from Almighty God. And if there was ever a generation that needed devils cast out of them, it's this generation. Somebody's got to rise up and be able to cast devils out of people because we've gone to a realm where uh, sin cannot be answered theologically. It never could be answered theologically, but we've reached a depth that it will take, if we're going to own our 50 feet, if we're going to see revival, then we can have personal revival. So in my own case, uh, they came too late to tell me it's passed away. Uh, I personally have been involved in two resurrections of the dead, my aunt and my son, Gary. Uh, we've got a miracle sitting on the front row. Jean had a stroke last Tuesday, and you're alive and well, right? <laughs> alive and well. Alive and well. Uh, miracles are here. And, and thank God when Gene had his stroke last Tuesday, we had the Holy Spirit. We had good doctors, but dear people, we had more than good doctors. We had the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Signs, wonders, miracles. They came to give Gene therapy, and Gene had almost recovered completely. And they came back and they said, well, we walked him up and down the hallways. He went up and down stairs. This was one afternoon after the stroke, and they said, we're going to let him go home. A miracle, a miracle. 
a miracle. And when all hell breaks loose, we like to know the Holy Spirit answers with signs, wonders, miracles of the Holy Spirit. So I want us to increase our faith for this. Uh, you know, Mark has been teaching on revival, and uh, I, I want us to increase our faith for this. I want us, with this thought of revival, and Mark's teaching us in this congregation to own our 50 feet, meaning that this should not operate, it can operate in a church, it should operate in a church if we need it, but the Bible says these signs, wonders, and miracles happen out here among the people. Uh, we don't need supernatural testimony here tonight. We believe, we have faith, we know Christ, but out there, uh, there is the need. So in Matthew chapter 9, verse 37, and I'll read through chapter 10, verse 1, Jesus is talking to his disciples. Now listen to what he says. The harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. And in 2023, we face a truly great harvest. I want us to understand uh, it, it's really bad out there. Sin is really uh, dark. Uh, Satan uh, is doing what he can to enforce his kingdom against God's kingdom. It, it's a bad, bad, bad world. I was born in 1939, and I could not ever have believed that I would have lived to see a society like I'm living in now facing the issues that women, men are facing today, having to pray with young grandchildren and young girls about things that we didn't even think about in my childhood. The harvest is great. And I want us to hear that as a word spoken from the Holy Spirit. The harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, will send laborers forth into the harvest. And, and that is the need now. There's plenty of need out there. We just need somebody to do, as Mark says, to own their 50 feet. Amen. And when Jesus called unto him his 12 disciples, now listen to what he did. He gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out. He sent them out into the harvest, and in sending them into the harvest, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out. And in this world of perversion, pornography, movies, filth, there's a lot of unclean spirits that are in the world. And the answer to that issue rests solely with the church. Because once you deal with a demon spirit, you cannot medicate it out. You cannot operate and take it out. Demon spirits have to be cast out. And they are cast out in the name of Jesus. And that responsibility is with the church. He gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out. I like this one. To heal all manner of sickness and all manner uh, of diseases. And then in verse 7 and 8, he said, As you go preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And here's our response. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Every one of those are supernatural. But yet it's authority that God gives to the church. And when we talk about revival, when we talk about souls being saved, when we talk about people coming into the kingdom, we have to understand we're dealing with people who have unclean spirits. We're dealing with people who've been caught in the dark, dark world of evil and sin and rebellion. And that has to be met not with just a song and a sermon and a, a pat on the back as we leave, it is met with supernatural power. 
Now, God gave us the Great Commission. Uh, one of the last things Jesus said, not the last, but one of the last, was that we have been commissioned. That literally means we've been, in, we've been instructed, we've been uh, given authority to go into all of the world and to preach the gospel. This is our assignment. This is what we have to do. This is what it's all about. Once you are born again, you will go to heaven, but you have an assignment. And everyone in the room is going to go in a different part of the world than the rest of us. Uh, I'm going to go tomorrow into my world. You'll go into your world. And we have an assignment in that world. We are to carry the light of the gospel. And I do not think that means that we corner everybody we meet in Walmart and try to shake Jesus into them. <laughs> but I call it going fishing. Uh, I, I tell people I go fishing. So when I, I go shopping, uh, I smile. And when they check me out and they say, we're glad you're here, I say, well, I'm glad to be here. How are you doing? And you'll be amazed how many people tell me their problems while I'm giving them my money and checking out. And, uh, you know, I'm a witness. It doesn't mean I catch everybody, but uh, I I'm fishing. Uh, I, I met a Muslim woman, and she was telling me all of her problems. And I listened to her, and I said, uh, well, I said, uh, I, I can pray for you. I said, I am a praying woman. I said, you might not want me praying for you because I'm a Christian, but I said, I am a praying woman and I will pray for you. And she said, oh, no, 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 I want you to pray for me. She said, it doesn't bother me We're you're a Christian. She said, you and I pray to the same God. And here's how I answered that. I said, well, I don't know what God you pray to, but I said, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know how you pray. This is the way I pray. And I said, the good thing about me praying to Jesus, I get answers. And she said, well, I want you to pray for me. That's fishing. That's fishing. And I still pray for her. And when I see her, I still pray for her. Lay hands on her. Pray for her. Fishing. Go into all the world. We've been instructed to do that, and we are not to take theology. We're not to... Just try to, you know, get people to believe what we believe. We are to demonstrate Amen. the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I told her that. I have supernatural power here. You know, I can pray for you. I, I can do this. Now, in Mark chapter 16, it ends with the Great Commission. And I, I just want to make note of what's said here. In Mark 16, verse 17, it said, These signs shall follow them that believe. Now, this, this is very clear. Signs follow us. We do not follow signs. We are not sign seekers. We're not looking for uh, Mr. Superman or Miss Superwoman. And, and we just go around following signs. Signs follow us. And signs are a mark of believing. How do we know that we believe? Signs follow our believing. These signs follow them that believe. Now we have something here even greater than the signs, wonders, and miracles that go on in, in the world to testify of the gospel, we have faith. And faith is our divine avenue to God, and with faith, all things are possible. So we have this supernatural uh, avenue of faith whereby God can come into our lives and can work signs, wonders, and miracles for us in the world they do not have faith, and they need the testimony 
uh, of God. You know, when Gene had his stroke last Tuesday, he woke up that morning and he couldn't walk and his face was pulled to one side and he couldn't talk. And, uh, I, you know, I called the ambulance. And I, I didn't know where we were. I didn't know an address. So I called the front desk of the hotel. And I said to the guy there, I said, uh, just send an ambulance to room 408. And, and they did. And they took Jean to the hospital. And uh, I went and followed Jean to the hospital, came back to the hotel later to take a shower about mid-afternoon. The guy was still at the desk. And he said, well, how's your husband? And I said, well, thank God he's doing well. He said, well, I'm glad to hear that. He said, you know, when I called the ambulance, the emergency people, they wanted to know what was going on. And he said, you never told me what was going on. You just said, send an ambulance. And they wanted to know if somebody was dead or choking or heart attack. And he said, I told them, I don't know what's going on, but it couldn't be too bad. She was very calm. <laughs> That's faith, 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 faith. We have faith. We don't need God to prove anything to us tonight. We have faith. And God will give us signs, wonders, and miracles. And in the world, he will testify to those who do not believe. We have faith. So I want you to, I want you to seek that kind of, testimony in your everyday life. I want us to have revival, but I, you can have your own revival where you go and what you, you do in life. I want us to have that kind of faith as men and women of Believer's Church. We do not follow signs. Signs follow us. I, I just know, you know, it said Peter one day in Acts walked by this man and they sought Peter's shadow to pass over them so that someone could be healed. Can you imagine having that kind of testimony yeah. that they wanted his shadow to pass over them so that they could be healed? That, that testimony just blows me away that people who don't know God would want my shadow to pass over them. And I, I read that one day and I thought, gee, I'd love to go to Walmart and my shadow would pass somebody who's sick and they'd say, whoo, glory, whoo, whoo, I'm healed, I'm healed, what happened? And I'd say, I'm sorry, that's just those signs that follow me everywhere I go. They just kind of jump on people. Wouldn't you like to have that kind of testimony? Your shadow, that kind of relationship with God. Oh, people, don't sell yourself cheap. Go deep with God. Go high with God. Press in to the Holy Spirit. So I want to end with this tonight. I'd like you just to lay hands on yourselves, and I'm going to pray a prayer for you. I'm going to do it from the Scripture. If you've never been baptized with the Holy Spirit, you'd like to be, then uh, I'm here, Pastor Phil is here, uh, Jean's here, other people can pray with you afterwards. But I'm going to read Acts 1.8. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit is come upon you and you shall be witnesses. You'll be those kind of witnesses, signs, wonders, miracles out in the world. You're going to go out into the world tomorrow. You're going to go to your jobs, the places where you hang out during the day. And tonight you are receiving power. I pray that the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And the reason this is happening is God needs you to witness. He needs you to go fishing tomorrow and to touch people. And then in Acts chapter 4, the, the early believers had been persecuted and beaten for their testimony but they prayed this prayer when they came together in a prayer meeting, Acts 4, 29 and 30. Grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth, God, your hand to heal 
and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of your holy child, Jesus. So, Father, I pray for us tonight that we receive the power of the Holy Spirit to be witnesses. And I pray this prayer for all of us, that you would grant unto us, believers, church, your servants, that with all boldness as we leave here, we will go into the world and we'll speak your word and you will testify by stretching your hand forth to heal. I, I pray that you will stretch your hand forth that signs and wonders may happen in the world to those to whom we come in contact and that mighty miracles will be done by the name of Jesus Christ. Give us authority over devils. Give us authority to minister. Lord, let your gospel be confirmed. What is preached here on the corner of Pope and Bomar, let it be seen in the world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, you're dismissed.